Yeah, I've got an idea for a fun project here. Um, I was talking to Dan Lucen, who runs the Midwest Gaming Classic, and he's doing this thing called uh, Gamer Nights, which is kind of like a prelude to the return of the Midwest Gaming Classic, which, if you don't know, is a fairly large uh, video game show here in Wisconsin. Typically takes place every spring in Milwaukee, or thereabouts Milwaukee. Obviously, it didn't happen in 2020. Nothing happened in 2020. Yeah, but uh, they're bringing it back. So um, I was talking to Dan about maybe doing some sort of video game tournament thing. So I had talked to him about that a while ago, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, the event is coming up like very soon. And I'm like, oh, crap. It's like, I just got back from my first post-COVID convention, which was, <clears throat> uh, what was it, uh, Midwest Rep Rep Fest. And now this show is happening. So I was like, okay, I'll think of something. So something that I thought of was maybe like a nest tournament, but with a twist. I was thinking it might be funny if um, you had, if you, ha you had like a group of three people trying to beat a video game, but... Each person had a controller, a standard NES controller, but each person could only do certain things. Like one controller, let's say one controller just does uh, the D-pad. Another controller just does the B button. And then someone has the A button. I was thinking something like Contra might be fun. Because unlike Mario, where you use B to accelerate, Contra B obviously shoots the gun, which is a more binary choice. I think that's why video games are so violent anyway. It's shooting a gun is a binary choice. You either do or you don't. So, you know, back in the days when there's just one button. Yeah, you're either shooting at a space invader or you're not. How to make this device. Well, I've got this breadboard here. So the first thing I'm doing here is I'm attaching uh, this breakout board that I got from Marlon P. Jones and Associates. I guess I could zoom in a little bit. Yeah, it's, these breakout boards are pretty handy because you can uh, basically convert a surface mount chip to a, you know, a uh, through hole chip. And I'm going to be using the um, Atmel Tiny AVR1 series. Uh, this is the 1614 chip. Got a bunch of these laying around. And also, my motivation for doing this is I'm also using this chip in another project that I am slowly making a video for. Using parts from one of those cheap Menards watches I found basically to make my own watch because this chip has a a real-time counter on it if you combine that with an external uh, watch crystal which is um, uh, <clears throat> 32,768 Hertz uh, you can basically make an RTC without needing an RTC since I'm using this chip for something else I'm working on a video that will will show up in the future and yes I'm still building things I just don't always have time to put it on YouTube. Remember, that's my thing now. I only put things on YouTube when I when I feel like it or when I have the time. This thing has an external, I'm sorry, this thing has an internal oscillator. We can run it at 16 or 20 megahertz. Obviously much faster than Nintendo runs. My idea is we attach three Nintendo ports to it. I got these from Video Game Exchange. Uh, Lance hooked me up. I also bought some laser discs got another Nintendo I can take apart, so I have three of these total. The reason I want to do that is so you can plug whatever Nintendo controller you want into this non-destructively without having to hack up the controllers. You basically just hack up the interface or you make a custom interface. Now I'm basing it off the wiring for this. This is the test rig that I'm using for the uh, calc or the watch project. And you can see we've got the screen from that cheap um, Menards watch. And then this header here looks kind of big, but 
Um, the reason I have this is I need this for the ICE programmer. Really, you only need three pins in Power Ground and then the um, UPDI, the Universal Programming and Debugging Interface. The other thing that's nice about these little, uh, these new AT Tinies is they have better peripherals than the old AT Tinies, like the classic ones, like the 25, 45, 85. I believe I made a video about this, but it's, well, you know, since microchip owns Atmel now. These chips are like a hybrid. Uh, it's AVR core with PIC peripherals. So the peripherals on this are better than the old tinies. Specifically, instead of having like a generic universal serial device, which the old tinies have, you get real SPY, UART, and I squared C. And we're going to be using SPY. Now, as some of you probably know, Nintendo controller had one 8-bit shift register in it. It was hooked up to the buttons in parallel. And then when the Nintendo, or specifically the programmer, wanted the data, the programmer would actually Fill a register. Actually, the programmer actually had to shift the bits via software. So the programmer would send some pulses, one pulse to latch the bits, i.e., load them off the buttons, which puts them into the registers, well, register, and then it would pulse it uh, eight times to clock the data back to the NES. So that's what I want to do with this. We shouldn't need any additional circuitry. This chip has a spy. Uh, peripheral on it, and if we operate in slave mode, this will be the slave to the Nintendo, which will be the master. So, it, and it's, um, it's hardware based, so we don't have to use any interrupts, well aside from the latch. So the Nintendo basically can latch data out of this chip at its leisure, or when it wants to, and then the rest of the time this chip can pull the data using bit banging off of the three controller ports. Okay, so we have the programming header here. Now most of the pins don't do anything. Again, it's going to a multi-purpose ICE programmer. Uh, yeah, so we have the UDPI programming line here. We have two ground references. We have power going to the microcontroller here. And I just need to attach the power to the reference voltage line for the programmer because if the programmer does not see a valid voltage, it won't work. Once I attach power reference there, There'll be enough here to program it. Of course, I haven't added a power supply yet. Um, this will run off the power from the Nintendo plug, plugged into the console itself. But I'll probably also add a plug so I can just drive this using USB power just for initial programming and testing purposes. All right, we have a port for attaching USB power for testing purposes. And then we have our programming port here. And our microcontroller goes in just like that. Cool. Okay, so I've got the Nintendo port here. It's power ground, clock data latch, pretty simple. So we have three controllers, but we can <clears throat> we can use the same latch and clock for all three of them. The only thing that will be discrete is the data being returned from each. So I'm gonna attach uh, three of these ports to this system with, with a little bit of slack on the cable so I can maybe build a 3D uh, printed case around this. So I'll probably have about inch and a half of slack like that. Wire that up here and then We'll pick some pins on here to use. We're going to use general purpose input output. We'll have to make sure that we do not use the, um, the spy pins because we're going to need those for the Nintendo itself. But we'll need uh, one, two, three, four, five pins. So we should have enough for that. So I think this is, so it's 14 pins minus three. So 11 minus five, six, that should be enough. I'm going to start wiring up the uh, ports now. So we've got power, and ground, and then this is clocked at a latch. These two, this is um, a return. You know, like if uh, the system wants to get some data back from the controller, if like if it's a fancy controller. The other one I believe is microphone slash light gun. If you remember the uh, Japanese Famicom had a microphone on the second controller. So I'm just gonna cut those wires off so there's less slop flapping in the breeze. So you can see here I created a power rail and a ground rail. I'm going to create a clock and latch rail as well. And then 
I'll attach the clock and latch of each controller port to that, and then the individual data return button I'll wire directly to a discrete pin on the controller. Here are the three Nintendo controller ports. Again, the clock and latch is tied together, and then each one of the data return lines is going into a discrete GPIO on the microcontroller. Now again, we're gonna have to bit bang this, but this microcontroller is, what? At least 10 times faster than the Nintendo, so we should be okay. I think we're gonna add a LED indicator light to this. And then uh, before I move into programming, which will be kind of like the second half of this video, I think I might as well attach the Nintendo cable as well. I mean, what will actually go from this into the real Nintendo? Yeah, here's a Nintendo controller. Oh, wait a minute. Why is there a hole in it? What is this, some sort of special Nintendo controller? What is this? Someone put a switch in it. What the heck? What the myself? I was looking for my Japanese dog bone controller. I mean, I would feel fine removing the cable from that since it's too short anyway, since it's, well, it's a Japanese version. Like the NES Mini. Nintendo was so lazy, they just had the same length cable for the Japanese and American version. Because they know people will buy whatever they make because Nintendo. Hey, you want to buy Zelda Breath of the Wild? This game came out four years ago. Eh, it's still full price. How come none of the whiners on YouTube ever complain about that? Whoa. Goofy Foot Nest Mod? Oh, yeah, I remember this one. It's like... It switches the A and the B. <sighs> well, it's not like I'm completely destroying it or anything. Oh yeah, I think this one like switches the A and the B buttons around. It looks like they just have a uh, dual pole, dual, ter dual terminal switch there and a standard shift register. Well, you know what? If you give me something out to show, it's mine. Possession is nine tenths of the law and Sometimes it might get its cable ripped off for a different project. Tis life. I think it was what? Castlevania 3? Looks like it's using the same colors. Wait, I have to stop singing because I have to strip these wires with my teeth. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah, I had the uh, <clears throat> second step. Yes. Second step of wire stripping tooth performed, which is the titanium screw implant into my jaw. So once that heals, I'll be able to get it scanned and then myself and my dentist can work on wire stripping tooth. Because you have like, um, oh here, I'll draw you. I'll draw it for you. Where's a pen? Okay, so let's say this is the, well, I'm sure they would call it the matrix of your jaw. So they drill a couple holes. This is after your tooth is removed. They put in a titanium screw, kind of like that. And then on top of it, they put a cap. And that's while it heals. So when the cap's in place, it's flush like that. And the cap, if you explode it here, it's, I believe it's a 1.5 millimeter uh, titanium threaded rod. Then when it's time to make the tooth, um, they, well, they do it like this. So let's say you have your tooth, right? And then there's a screw, and then there's threads like that, which goes in here, right? So they put the tooth in place against the abutment. So the tooth kind of has 
uh, a fillet inside of it. They put it in place and then they put the screw down into it. They screw it in place. And then they actually put a little bit of wax on top of the screw head in case you ever need to remove it. And they fill the top of that with a substrate. So really the two plugs in, the tooth plugs in and then you screw it in place. So um, I thought, this is my uh, second lower bicuspid, is to make a tooth kind of like this. wire stripping tooth right so when it interfaces with my upper teeth which are both crowns so that's fine most of my teeth are crowns put the wire in and then whip it out so it's my idea I want to have the world's well I don't know if it's a world's first wire stripping tooth but I want to make it I'm, I'm going to make it no, no he won't yes I will I told my dentist my dentist knows me very well I'm like uh, Terry I've got this idea for this implant and Normally I would say you're gonna think I'm crazy, but you know me pretty well. And then I told him the plan, he's like, yeah, I think we can do that. Only problem is we can't make it out of titanium. I mean, I'd like to, I mean, if I could, I would just get a laser centered titanium tooth made. I mean, cause the thing is, the implants are so expensive, why not use titanium? Can't though, because it would be the strongest thing in my mouth and it would damage other teeth. So we're probably gonna go for, um, we're gonna, Probably amalgam of like gold and something else. All right, uh, I'm just gonna double check that these, um, I'm not gonna trust that these wire colors match. I'm gonna double check it. And then I'm gonna wire these up to the, well, I've got it written right here. The, um, well, let's see, master out, slave in, master in, slave out, clock and uh, chip select. So this is, this device will be acting as a slave. So this will be master in, slave out. Yes, yeah, so this device will output the data on this pin when it's clocked by the Nintendo on this pin, and then we'll need one more line for the latch, which we'll just tie to an interrupt. Uh, that way, uh, the Nintendo can interface the spy of this chip as it would any, it would, you know, we don't need to use code. The, the Nintendo can actually interface directly with this hardware. Well, it should work. Ah, uh, yeah, color coding matches, but you know what they say, measure twice, cut once. I think this is everything we need. We have a temporary power supply USB cable that we can remove later. We've got the cable going back to the Nintendo. I've added a power LED light. Got some test pins here. So this is clock and data going back to the Nintendo. Uh, we can test this uh, initially by having the microcontroller output what it reads from the controllers. Then we have a ground pin for an oscilloscope and of course our three plugs and our programming header. All right, I think we should be ready to switch over to programming mode. Here's all the stuff. We got the ice programmer, the adapter plug, which is why I needed that header. We got it hooked up to the scope, we got our three inputs, and our power supply got power going to it. Uh, yeah, so first thing we'll do is we'll bit bang the information off the controllers. There's a million tutorials online. Well, not that, yeah. There's figuratively a million tutorials online of how to do that. But the thing we're doing differently here is we're using the uh, the spy bus send the data back to the Nintendo itself. So uh, let's get started. I've been having some trouble with my Logitech G35 headset. It's actually probably the computer, not the headset. Anyway, uh, let's go into device programming. All right. Oh yeah, I unplugged the programmer because I was experiencing USB anomalies. Let's take something from X-Files. Scully, there are USB anomalies. We have to figure out what's up. And then the government has been has been hiding the anomalies from the people. All right, there we go. The ship is connected. Uh, I've got a starter program here. I've, I'm working on another project that also uses this uh, chip. It's um, it's a DIY watch project using the LCD from that cheap Menards well watch. You're using a knife to make a knife. Do you know a better way? What, what show is that from? Anyway, I've copied some of the code over. So the first thing I want to do is set up the spy and then also um, the Bitbang I.O. so we can read the Nest controller. Okay, we're going to put the special flag into the change protection register there. Then we're going to change the CPU to have no divider. So it'll be 20 megahertz. Wait for the clock to synchronize. I'll get to that in a little bit. Something we got to remember, even if we're using hardware spy, we still have to set the output pins of the spy to be output. It's a little weird. I don't know why I have to do that, but we do. Okay, so just for the initial test, we're gonna do the spy in master mode. 
So the spy, zero, control register, A. We're going to do the master, enable, and then also its speed. Right now it's set to double speed. And I got the scope here. I noticed some wavy lines on the screen, and I was like, what are those? And then I remembered, oh, there's a Nintendo cable attached to this. So let's see if we take uh, one. If we take one divided by 60, that's, uh, what is that? That's 16 milliseconds. Five milliseconds of division. One, two, three, point sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what that is? <laughs> Can you, <laughs> if you're playing along below, it is the frequency of the wires in the walls, the AC basically of our wiring, affecting these. Uh, you notice that too. Like if you just touch the probes with your fingers, you usually see a pretty nice uh, sixty hertz sine wave. That darn AC is everywhere. So. In a way, that cable is acting like a bit of an antenna. <laughs> All right, let's create a function called send spy. Pretty simple. Uh, you call it, it puts the data into the data register, and then it waits for the register to be empty. Peace mode. Oh, that's another cool thing with this. I mean, you can also debug over that one wire interface, which is pretty nice for such a small thing. Oh, why do you always, ah, so dumb. <laughs> you have to select the tool twice. Hmm. Well, it, it asserted Oh, you know what probably is? I probably forgot to set the um, set the I/O for it here. Let's just try to grab a single. Let's go into the trigger mode. Yeah, let's see, trigger the captain of her hearts. Do 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 do. There it is. Okay. All right. So that's our clock. All right. So there's three controllers. So we need. Uh, Three bytes. How about nest pad? Three. So we'll have three bytes. PB0 is latch. PB1 is clock. So those are both outputs. So we have port. Okay. Oh, it looks like I already have them set as outputs. So we're setting the direction of those bits to be that. Cool. Get. I'll call it get pads. Right. All right, so the first thing we need to do is pulse the latch. So that would be what? Oh, yeah, we can do the whole thing, or we can just do bits. Well, bits bits is cool. So we can do port. Well, it's port B. Um, let's see. We already set the direction. So we need out set. would make it high. Out clear would make it low. So this is kind of cool. Um, this particular chip allows you to do atomic operations, which means you don't have to read in the status of the register and then or it and then write it back. You can actually in one instruction, you can change it, which, again, is very pick-like. Uh, okay, so let's see. This is latch. This is PP0. So we want to go out set. Yes. And then the first bit. Pull slash, and then delay microseconds. Yeah, probably, probably not too many. And then after we pulse it high, we want to pulse it low. So we would do out clear. So out means that we're output into the port. Clear and set as if we're setting. We're clearing the one or the zero. And see how this didn't change. So basically, we're affecting the LSB. We're just changing what we're doing to it. Okay, now we need a loop to build the bytes. <clears throat> For int 8, I mean, honestly, well, I would say half the reason I got the Roomba was because of Bud, but actually 100% of the reason I got the Roomba was because of Bud. Uh, twofold, it can sweep up his hair, especially underneath furniture, and also it can act as his brother or sister. I, I mean, it's a, I guess the Roomba doesn't have a gender. Does it talk? Actually, I think it did talk once. I believe it was a female's voice. Okay, the Roomba's the Roomba is his sister. All right. Um, oh no, the Roomba's coming down the hallway to get me. All right. So the first thing we want to do is look at the data on each one of the output pins. So that's gonna be a PA5, PA6, PA7. Uh, let's just jump ahead to the part where we pulse the clock. Uh, I guess I could. Well, 10 microseconds isn't very much. Uh, let's see. The clock is on. Two, okay, so this will be pulse clock. Now notice how we're doing that after we get the first bit, because after you pulse latch, the first bit, or the MSB of the shift register will already be on the port. 
Uh, port A in, so this is something that we would read. Okay, let's do U8 temp equals port A in. So that should allow us to read that. Let's see if that compiles. All right, it's the first time I've tried reading a pin on this. Okay, so that's going to, according to our sheet, we have PA5, PA6, PA7. So let's just right off the bat, let's do port A in, and we're going to end it with, uh, what would that be? E0. That'll lob off everything but the top three bits. Grab value and lob off bits. All right, now we have those three bits, and we need to separate them because each one of them is going to go into into one of the three bytes, the uh, nest pad bytes. Now, I'm not exactly sure about the bit order. I was looking at some tutorials on, online. You know, I have a 50% chance of getting it wrong, or getting it right, which means it'll be wrong, because Murphy and her law. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's do, because um, as I mentioned, there's three bits, so uh, what would that be? That would be two. So yeah, we'll just mask it off one by one. So temp equals port in and that. So that'll be for controller one, which is on PA5, which means we need to shift it one, two, three, four, five to the right. So we go temp, dun dun equals five. Shift to MSB or LSB, I'm sorry. Then we'll do nest pad zero or equals temp. So if there's a one there, it'll add it in. And if there isn't, uh, it won't. Uh, oh, also we'll need, we'll need to clear uh, nest pad or all three of those as well. Because if we're, if we're oaring it in, uh, if there's already something there, we won't be able to erase it. So we'll do nest pad zero equals zero. Yeah, I could use a, a loop here, but this is actually more efficient since there's not much of it. <laughs> Look at that. I was like, oh, nest pad one equals one. No, no, it doesn't. Da, da, da. Okay, clear those. So remember, by default, um, all the buttons will be high unless you push it, then it goes low. Okay, so shift to LSB, nest pad or equals temp. So we'll take uh, bit five, We'll basically mask off everything with that. We'll shift it five to the right so it's in the LSB, and then we'll add it into nest pad. Then we'll pulse the clock, and then we'll take nest pad zero, and then we'll bit shift it one to the left, which makes room for the next LSB. Well, actually, we'll, well we've got to do that for all three, so yeah. So bit banging is when you interface with hardware, such as a shift register, without using peripherals on your side. So then we actually have to do this three times. Now, I guess technically port could change. Well, actually, no, it doesn't matter because we, we did the single latch. So the port is not going to change. This, the output register is not going to change until we do the latch again. The latch takes the inputs and puts it onto the output buffer. Yeah, so then we just go up. We go yeah, one, two, four, and then this would be eight. And, of course, each one of these we need to shift more to the right. So that would be six. And seven, and that would be one and two. Let's see if we got any grammatical errors. Maybe Grammarly can help. How does gram? I wonder. I wonder. Well, I'm not going to say if Grammarly spies. I'm going to say I wonder what kind of spying Grammarly does to make money. Hmm. I guess we can plug in an S controller and see what happens. We just get a. Yeah. Sometimes I'll turn the Roomba on using my phone if Bud is like bothering me in the kitchen. Uh, yeah, the last bit appears low, but the rest of them are working. Well, except for the one, that, okay, so A, A isn't working. B, select, start, up, down. Come on, stay steady. And target, down, left, right. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. It's not the clocks. It's where I do the bit shifting. See how I bit shifted one to the left after the sequence? Well, by doing that, I bit shift the LSB one to the left and I bit shift the MSB off into oblivion. So the solution is to do that first. So the first time this loop runs, it's all zero, so who cares? But then after it does its last uh, or, the LSB will stay where it is because it won't go back and do this one more time. So 
Oh, sorry. I, rookie mistake. I should have known better. Yeah, that's what it should look like. Up, down, left, right. Okay, so it looks like A is the first bit out. Because that goes into the uh, MSB. Remember, it got shifted to the left seven times. Cool. Well, up here's the reading part works. So, uh, well, of course, I'm going to separate this. So one of them will only have, you know, up, down, left, right. Then we'll we'll do that with bitwise operations. What, what's it? Oh, okay. So right is the last one. Uh, I mean, basically, we'll just take three controllers and then we'll bitwise it together. So each controller only does a few things and then we'll make it into one byte packet. And that's what we'll send back to the NAS. My desk is a complete mess. Okay, get pads. Spy zero. Data equals. It couldn't be this easy, could it? Okay, I've got my retro AVS NAS here. It's running in picture in picture on HDMI. I converted this to slave mode. I haven't put any code in it yet, but we can see that we are getting the eight pulses from the Nintendo. So uh, that's a good start. I did get it to work, although uh, it has to be holding uh, chip select SS or slave select low. Yeah, I wonder if I can just disable using that. I mean, we might not even need the latch, although I'll probably attach that to an interrupt and that'll actually be when it updates the register. I guess we could cheat and use Atmel start. Uh, let's see, drivers, spy, add component. Do, 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 do. Mode. Spy slave interrupt. Sure. Can we disable that? Okay. Spy mode 2. We're using that one because we want the data to be valid before the rising clock edge. All right, let's see what kind of code that, that creates. Oh. Is it going to make me use SS? Then why is it even an option? Oh, I found this uh, diagram online. So here's the latch pulse. And then the first bit, which is the A button, should be available. And then with each clock, it brings in the new bit. So that's why we're using spy mode too. So the data is available before the rising edge, not after. And then as you can see, the last one basically shifts it off into oblivion. Back here in Cheaterville, we've got Atmel start. See, I like this sometimes because sometimes you don't even know what to name ISRs. It varies by every chip. But this, you know, Atmel start, the configurator will give you some hints. Okay, latch, initial level, low, pin direction in, invert IO on a pin, no sense rising edge. All right, will that give us code? The driver ISR. Nope, it didn't generate anything there. Would that be under CPU control? Global interrupt enable. <laughs> Now, we're enabling that in our code uh, with SEI, which sets a bit in the special register flag, but yeah, include pin change. Oh, pin change ISI harness in blah, blah, blah. Okay. And there it is. Port B, port vector. Okay, so when that pin rises, this ISR should be called. Let's copy this ISR. We'll put it into, that stands for internet, uh, internet, <laughs> interrupt service routine. And put the bracket where it should be. All right, so I'm thinking what we could do is, uh, let's do this. Let's make another byte. We'll call it pad out. And if this is called pad out equals nest pad the reason I want to do this is so um, we can see if it actually gets updated or not oh and this should be static volatile oh. it's a very volatile uh, well that's so it doesn't possibly it, it might get uh, compiled out uh, when we uh, when we compile it so we should always have a static volatile for anything that's going to be in an ISR uh, should have done that up here too Okay, so down here, spy data equals pad out. So we can use this to see if an interrupt is actually activating. I think this is the magic sauce here. The pin end control port X pin end control register is used to configure IO pull up input sensing of pin. Okay, so port X pin end control. Let's just grab that. 
Oh, okay. Oh, so this would be the data structure inside of that. So, okay. <laughs> Confused yet? I know I am. Okay, so this would be, when did we put that on port B? Port B1, so that would be. Okay, that took, see how it turned uh, purple? That means it's valid. Let's go back to the F and data sheet. Uh, let's see, we want the rising edge, so let's see. We don't want to invert it, blah, blah, blah. Rising edge, which would be two, so let's make this equal two. You've enabled interrupts, port B vector, interrupt flag clear. I think that should work. Uh, we'll know if it works. Uh, I'll still have to manually um, uh, pull SS low, but we'll know if it works if the nest pad is actually updated. I should have added a pin for this. Well, I didn't realize I needed it. Oh, yeah, see, there you can see it changing. Okay, so the interrupt is working, that's good. And things are changing on the screen. Oh no, I'm accidentally changing my settings. No! I started a cartridge, a Super Contra. You can see it's pulling both controllers now. Um, hmm, start's not working though. I'm kind of wondering if maybe the Nintendo isn't responding because the pulses aren't where it expects it to be. Well, why does that make a difference? I mean, it was working like the main menu of the EverDrive, not the EverDrive, the Retro USB was working, but of course that is an FPGA. It runs infinitesimally faster than the Nintendo. What if I change the um, spy mode, if I can get these to line up better? So you can see the pulses coming from it, but... The thing to keep in mind, when you're in the menu of the uh, retro uh, Nintendo thing, it's running an FPGA, but when you start the game, it's actually the game code driving these pulses. It's a big, not just driving them, but reading them, so... And it's, you know, locked at like 1.6 megahertz, whatever the Nintendo is. So that's a big difference. I think I found a clue. Okay, so in the menu, we only had one controller being pulsed. But then when I tried Super Contra, it was pulsing both controllers. So now I'm trying Mega Man, which only pulses uh, one controller. And you see we got some wacky data at the end. However, the game itself is working. Kind of wonder at this point if I should just do it with interrupts. Like bit bang the Nintendo output with interrupts. Look for the latch, prepare the data, and then just shift the data one bit every time I see a clock signal. I'm getting, I'm having trouble getting the hardware spy to line up with the Nintendo. I suppose 30 years difference in time <laughs> between the peripherals can be part of the problem. Because, you know, there's a shift register on the controller, but the Nintendo is, well, the Nintendo is... For all intents and purposes, bit banging out the data. It's using a, a special register on the CPU, but it's still being bit banged by software. If I do it, if I do it with interrupts, I could make the timing exactly what the Nintendo expects. Because I can, it works in the um, in the main screen, like moving the menu around for the retro USB. But again, I'm sure that has much. Well, I'm not sure. I know it has a much higher frequency than a Nintendo, which means it's probably sampling the edges sooner and getting valid data, whereas a Nintendo is too slow. Uh, this is the system in question, if you haven't seen it before. Um, it's FPGA-based. You put the cartridges in here, and then what's cool is that you can... Well, here, well I'm not going to... Oh, yeah, by the way, yes, I own Mega Man. But there's a slot here, vertically, for putting in uh, Famicom cartridges, which is pretty cool. Um, well, yeah, so that solved one of the problems, so... Yeah. So this um, this weird end state condition you see here, that's what's screwing things up. I, it still might be better off just doing it with, with edges and interrupts and bit bangs. In the data sheet, uh, chapter 16, port pin IO configuration. If you look at the ports here, um, we've used a couple of these already. Dir, dir, set, uh, in, int flags. Uh, yeah. But there's also pin control see this now it's a little bit confusing because like pin 0 pin 1 pin 2 pin 3 so if you're looking at like port a uh, PA 0 that would be pin 0 control and what we can do with this register is actually set up an interrupt on each pin and we're going to be using the rising edge although we might change that later so back in the code we've put in port B pin 2 control that's what's connected to latch coming from the Nintendo We've set that to rising edge detect. 
Port A, pin 3 control, that's the clock coming from the Nintendo. Again, rising edge attach, and then this uh, enables the interrupts. So I've actually removed the spy driver. It's too bad I wanted to use that. I mean, that's a more elegant way of doing it, but it wasn't consistent enough. All right, let's look at the interrupts. So we have an interrupt for anything on port B and anything on port A. Now you might be saying, well, how do you know? I mean, in this case, we only have one interrupt per port. And a port is a group of pins. And you might say, oh, well, how do you know which one tripped it? And it's like, well, you don't really. I mean, if you had multiple interrupt pins set up, you'd actually have to go in and check the flags uh, right there. And again, there'd be one of these for each port. So you'd be like, okay, well, which, which interrupt was triggered? You check the flag and then you'd have a you know you'd have like a state machine inside the isr depending on which one was triggered but in this case there's only one per okay so let's look at what happens here so when the nintendo latches which it does quite a ways ahead of the pulses unlike the menu system of the retro avs when it latches we're going to copy the data over data out is the byte we're going to send out to the controller so right now we're just grabbing it from nest pad zero and we set the bit count how many bits we've shifted to zero okay of course, right down here, we clear the interrupt flag. So that's also what you would check. Like if you wanted to, you know, see which flag was tripped, you would also look at this. So it'd be a one if it was tripped. And then to clear the flag, you actually write a one to it. Because remember, most electronics, writing and reading to something can have different effects. And Bud is still whining outside my door, despite the fact I just gave him food. I am out of greenies, though. I mean, like everything else, greenies have gone up in price. What a surprise. Uh, anyway, so it asserts bit. So basically, that means it gets the first output bit ready as soon as the latch is put up because the Nintendo is going to read that before the next clock. So pretty simply, we just look at the MSB and uh, we either set or clear that pin if it's there or not. Then we bit shift data one to the left. So the next digit will be in the MSB. Then we increment bit count. And then for the clocks, just individual clocks themselves, uh, each time we just call assert bit, which will continue to do the shift. Then back in our main loop, the only thing the main loop does is if it continuously checks bit count. And if bit count equals eight, that it will update the pads. So it will only it will only resample the pads after the previous clocks are sent to the Nintendo. We do it that way so that we don't have a partially formed, uh, erroneously shifted byte going back to Nintendo. Bud, what is your issue? Oh, oh yeah, it's the morning time, so Bud is in needy mode. Bud, I can't let you in here because if I let you in here, the first thing you're going to do is try to jump on my plant and break off another one of its stems, so forget it. Oh, I saw this rubber glove on. Still, uh, my finger's not fully healed yet. They took the stitches out, um, but uh, I still have to kind of protect it because I don't want the, the skin to be, you know, ripped off. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Well, the guy, the doctor who removed the stitches, I, I'm glad he was candid about it. He's like, well, you got to be careful because, yeah, if you were to hit, the, hit that on the edge of something, you could just tear the flap right off again. And I'm like, oh, well, um, thank you for your candor. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create these bit masks. And let's see, who, who has control of, of select and start? Let's give everyone control of select and start. So what I'm doing here is I'm just selecting which, which bits. So if I want to, you know, if I want to let a player only control the D-pad, I will and, I will and their value of D-pad mask, and that will remove their ability to do these two. Each controller can be in one of three states. It's like, is it controlling A, B, or the D-pad? However, the system, yeah, the system is about which controller is doing which. Yeah, but you also have to make sure two controllers aren't doing the same thing, or you have to make sure, and you also have to make sure one controller is always, you know, you, there always has to be an A, there always has to be a B. Oh, great coincidence. I activated the Roomba to distract Bud while I made this video about game controllers. And then the Roomba just got caught up by sucking in the cord of a game controller in my living room. And I guess you could just shift these. But then it's all, well, uh, math was never my strong suit. It really isn't. So don't tell me that it is, because it's not. <laughs> so we would do data equals nest pad zero and then or that nest pad one or with nest pad two. I think I'm doing this backwards. 
I think I should or equal it. Yeah, one, zero, zero. one, zero. One, 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 one. Basically mask out a zero for what you can push and a one for what you can't. So that would be that. And then the D-pad guy would be that. Because if you've, if you've got a, a controller input, if, the con if a button's not being pushed, it's going to be a 1. But if you OR it with a 1, even if it's a 0, it's still going to end up being a 1. Of course, I still need to combine these all with uh, the output. Okay, so I'm, I've hard-coded it to case 1. So nest pad 0 should only be allowed to move the D-pad. Let's see if this still works. All right, look at Mega Man over here. Okay, he's moving back and forth. And he cannot jump, but he should be able to pause. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we have to we have to set this to a zero because if we or if we or equals it, any existing bits and data. Oh wait a minute, data out should already have been cleared because we bit shifted it all the way to the left. Well, just being safe, and it stopped working. What if we try this? Make it all ones and then and it with this one, which means if there's any zeros in this pad, it'll pull those bits low and data out. Now the question is, can I add other, maybe I have to, maybe instead of, yeah, I was oaring all the nest pads together, maybe I just need to add them in separately. So let's add them in one at a time. Well, I guess, it, you know, it doesn't really matter if it, fit. <laughs> might as well just go for it. Jarvis, sometimes you need to run before you can walk. Got my dog bone controllers here, and yes, they're all real, although unfortunately this one is for the Famicom, which means it has a really short cord. I should just put a longer cord into it. Uh, I'm just gonna try this one at a time. Uh, I'll just change which, uh, which you know, nest pads zero, one, two. Make sure these are all working, and then we can do the bit shifting and then add the gamification factor. Ah, that appears to be working. Okay, so this controller can move left and right, up, down. It can also pause, but it cannot shoot. This one can only jump. And this one can only shoot. Nice. All uh, right, I just had to uh, use the bitwise operators correctly. Although this should work with uh, two-player games now as well. Because remember, it's only gonna, it's only going to send out eight bits. So even if the Nintendo continues, well, the Nintendo continued to ask for bits, but I'm not going to sample the controllers until I see the latch again. But seriously, you are really annoying. Can you hear what I hear? Can you hear what I hear? A cat, a cat, whining in the hallway. I already fed him, so what is the deal? I already fed him, so what is the deal? Do -do 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 -do. Said the little cat to the guy who owns him. Go and buy some greenies, go and buy some greenies. They are really expensive now, don't you know, cat? I don't care, I'm a cat. I'm cute, I'm fat, and I lay around. Unfortunately, I also make sounds. Change a few things around here. I'm going to add more states, so basically I'll flip-flop uh, which controller is A and B each time. I know how to get rid of Bud. Activate the droids. There he goes. <laughs> All too easy. But the thing is, when a state changes, it can't be in the same state. So if I do this, there's a greater likelihood. Or would there be a greater? Uh, well, each one of these has to be different. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, well yeah, wait. Yeah, this is dumb. I can't do it this way. Oh wait, no, okay, case two, nest pad two equals B. Right now, the switcher thing, or what would I call it, the social nest, is being powered by the Nintendo. However, I think I might actually use like an external power supply, just like a USB plug or something, wall wart charger. Uh, that way I could maybe attach a buzzer to it or some sort of flasher light to indicate that, you know, the change is either occurring or about to occur. Uh, let's see, I have PA7, PB3, and PA1 left over. So I'm thinking maybe a buzzer and a light, and then maybe a button. I've added a MOSFET and a transistor for the light and the speaker, respectively. I made these slits here so I can just put these 
connectors right through it. Yeah, Bob's your uncle. Beauty. I think I've got everything installed that I need. I mean, I just had to add, just had to add the, you know, the MOSFET and the transistor for the light. That's pretty much it. Life hack. Magnet. Wow, life hack. I can make a whole YouTube channel about life hacks. Oh, wait, that's the wrong size screw. Oops. Let me push these through. Should fit flush to the front. And the top case will hold them in place. Might add a little super glue or hot glue, but I don't know. That might jinx it. Yeah, just like that. So in here we got power going to the light and the speaker, and then we have the two returns. Uh, which is to the transistor and the MOSFET coming from the speaker. So yeah, we'll just power this with an external uh, USB wall wart. It should be fine. So I don't know what the speaker came from, but it's going in. I don't know where it's from, but I know where it's going. Oops, it's going in this. Ooh, that's going to be a tight fit. Actually, that might not fit. Crap, I might have used a different speaker. Oh well, I've got many. Okay, well, once the top half prints, I'll attach this white LED to it and a speaker, but apparently not this one. And uh, yeah, then we'll still have access to the programming port in the back so we can finish the code with the light and the buzzer in place. Uh, here's the front half, got a speaker, and then our LED. All right, let's close it all up. I'm sure everything will fit just fine. There won't be any problems, obviously. All right. I think the front of it was probably a little thicker than it needed to be. Oh well. I should probably add a button just in case, just in case I need to like change modes. I'll just drill a hole manually for that. Okay, well now this is, this is together, we can uh, finish the programming. I like to watch Dave Jones mailbags when I'm working on stuff. It's inspirational. Okay, I've got it hooked up. Um, I'm testing out the button and the light, so right now the button will just drive the light. Should be pretty good. It's pretty bright, so I think we'll do like, we'll have like a beep, 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 you know, like when it's about to change, like beep, 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 or it could be like beep, 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 beep. Yeah, that's for the speaker. Uh, yeah, all right, so those two things work. Now let's test out the speaker. One nice thing about this chip is that it has very robust timers. It has uh, three of them, I believe. Type A, B, and D. These two are 16-bit. I think they have different features in each one. We just need, okay, this one's not as complex. Uh, we just need a square wave. And let's see. If we set up the timer, then we can just change the period, and then that'll give us different tones. Yes, PB3. All right, so, un, so under, uh, so it's going to be timer A, and then it's going to be output 0, and then, uh-oh, what's this 3 mean? Alternate pin position. All right, so we need to use the port multiplexer first. Because normally, by default, that timer output is on PB0, but we're using that for something else, so we need to switch it to the alternate position. Port multiplexer. This Most modern chips have this. This allows you to change what pins go to where. I mean, some chip, some integrated circuits, it's almost completely, uh, it's almost completely interchangeable. You can put any pin anywhere you want. Timer counter B1. Okay, we want A1. Okay. TCA zero waveform output zero, right? This bit to one to select the alternative output pin for that. Okay, and that's what we want. So that's bit zero. So uh, we just set this to zero. Again, you don't always exactly know. I haven't used port mux yet on this. Okay, that's the thing. And then we have control C and then we set the low bit. All right, cool. We've selected the alternative pin for that. Set alt pin for TC, TCA W0. All right, now we need to set the timer itself. Google and GitHub to the rescue. I hear that IT is like 90% Googling. I do it too. I'd be lost without Google. I wonder if the average engineer, if they got sent back in time to, oh, I don't know, 1885, if they would actually be able to reverse engineer a time circuit from memory using vacuum tubes. So yeah, you'd have to, you'd have your 1985 knowledge and you'd have to remember vacuum tubes, which would be about 30 years old in 1985. 
And then you probably wouldn't even know what was actually inside of the chips. I doubt you could actually do it in vacuum tubes. Oh, well, it's, it's, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I doubt you could do it in vacuum tubes that would fit on a hood. Control B enables compare channel zero. Okay, that's what we want. Frequency waveform generation. Yep. On compare. Uh, yeah, this code looks, uh, this looks good. What did, uh, <laughs> oh, wait, not, not Steve Jobs, Picasso. Good artist copy, great artist steal. Well, I guess they both said it. I'm no Picasso, but do you like it? Tell me, what do you know about... I don't know anything about Batman. Oh, how about little you and me? Wow, the audio quality is amazing. Let's try 20, or 10, I mean. It's not very loud. Got to help me get hub, help, help me get hub, help me get hub, help, help me get home ball, help me get hub, help, help me get hub, help me get hub, help, help me get home ball, help me get hub, help, help me get hub, help me get hub, help, help me get hub, help me get hub, yeah, get the code out of my heart, yeah, stop. Uh, note duration equals the duration. I just called to see what condition my condition was in. Oh, there, there's a karma chameleon. They come and go. Help me get hub. Yeah, get her out of my heart. <laughs> You've got to help me get hub. Help. <laughs> It's kind of catchy. Help me get up. Help, help. Boom, boom, boom. Help me get up. Help, help me get. <laughs> you know, some people say, you know, you should probably sing less. You know, every time you type that into YouTube, it encourages me to sing more. So, oh, I would say don't type it, but it w won't have any effect. I'm not going to, I don't care. Okay, this is the main loop. Right now it runs as fast as possible. Let's, let's make the loop run at, well, it's not going to be exactly, but. Basically at 1,000 hertz. It's not interrupt driven, I guess it could be, but. It sounds like a helicopter. We're here hovering above the streets of Los Angeles where where hour five of this police chase is, it, is in progress. Uh, the blown out tire has destroyed 16 miles of solar roadways at a cost to the taxpayer of $9 billion. But solar frickin' roadways are, are the future. I mean, seriously, has any of these celebrities talking about solar roadways never seen a police chase? Yeah, if I push the button, let's do play note. Uh, let's do 3,000 for one. Well, it's 500. Okay. And then at the same time, we'll turn on the light. Then we'll have another function. If note duration, so basically if a note is playing, if duh, duh, note duration equals zero... Uh, then we will turn off the light and we'll set the timer to zero, which means there won't be any notes. Too many notes. Which one would you like me to remove? Okay, that's less annoying. Yeah, cool. All right, uh, I might, well, I mean, who cares? So the divider, that's going to take the, um, the main clock frequency, and that's what it's using to drive the timer. So if we divided it by a smaller number, so right now it's taking 20 megahertz divided by uh, 64, which would be, who knows? Remember when I told you I wasn't good at math? I'm not good at math. 312,500, I used my computer, look that up. Uh, yeah, oh, this should be fine. We'll just find some, you know, I'll just, I'll just wing it. I'll just make up some notes. So I'd like three notes. So let's see, if note, if note duration expires, uh, do all this. Then we'll have another counter, counter called alarm. This is just how many times it beeps. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. So that'll only happen if the note is active. Then Mozart made his blackest play, his darkest play. He actually brought his father back from the dead. Uh-oh, this delay function that gives us the timing for the audio breaks. 
the Nintendo interface probably has something to do with an interrupt. So maybe we do need, well, speaking of interrupts, maybe we do need a timer for the audio. So here's an example from the same guy. So, oh, who is this? Chromia? Chromia. Chromia. It looks like it's German. Okay, well, thank you to Chromia. These examples are very handy. Here's a timer B example. How handy. Timer B is set to compare mode, uh, capture, and then control A, enable, enable interrupts, and then it's going to this vector, which is the TCB uh, zero interrupt vector. Clear the flags. Okay, yeah, we can just, uh, let's just uh, borrow this. All right, so let's use the setup code here. All right, compare. Well, it's gonna it's gonna depend on what the prescaler is. Where where is it setting up the prescaler? Oh, default clock twenty megahertz. Clock per default prescaler is default prescaler is six. Twenty divided by six is three point three. Okay, so they're not using well, they're not changing the the prescaler using the default interrupt interval one milliseconds. Oh well, that's that's fine. That's exactly what we need. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> oh no, Bud came in here. Bud has entered the forest. Okay, so we time this ISR fires. Music. Uh, it well, we'll increment it. Well, I don't think we have to really have to worry about missing it. It's not like it's that important. And down here in our main loop, we'll still do the bit count every time. Although we could do that. Well, no, because checking if bit count equals eight is really no different than checking a flag. Uh, so if music, that flag is set, clear the flag. Nah. Uh, well, yeah, because we got the button there too, and we still need to add the randomizer. Although the randomizer, I think, well, yeah, that'll get triggered. Oh, yeah, that does get triggered by the music because it'll happen after the beep. Let's refractor it. Let's rename it to uh, Looper, your favorite movie. Looper was good. Why did Last Jedi suck? Yeah, Last Jedi sucked. Go ahead and leave a comment below, but it sucked. Terrible, terrible storytelling. Terrible. It's like a master class on how not to tell a story. <laughs> you know, say what you will about the Star Wars prequel trilogies, and yeah, they're kind of badly directed and terribly acted, but the story was solid. Well, even, even McGregor was good because I think he was the only one who realized what kind of a movie it was. He just kind of went for it. Hello there. All right, controller's still working. Let's see if the... Eh. I think the timing's off, but it's it's working. <laughs> I just need to draw something. Clock div one is the default. It seems like there's no divider. If that's the case, it should be uh, 20,000 periods do one microsecond not i'm sorry one millisecond not uh three 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 well let's see if that makes a difference programming yeah that was the issue kind of sounds like pole position prepare to qualify That's why it pays to RTFM. No, oh, I should probably probably mow the front lawn tonight. Actually, it's not too warm out. Someone just texted me. It's Charlie Emery, the owner of Spooky Pinball. Oh, look at some art from the new game. Halloween. Looks like he snuck in a meatloaf reference. I wonder if they got a Roadhouse reference. There's, there's a uh, inside joke. Every spooky pinball machine has a reference to Roadhouse in it. Usually it's a line of dialogue. I wonder if they got that into Halloween. I guess we'll find out. Oh, yeah, so the next spooky pinball machine is, is based off the 1978 John Carpenter movie, Halloween, uh, using our new board sets uh, that Parker designed and I programmed. So I think, I think they'll probably have the full reveal in... Uh, well, I guess it is July. Should have the full reveal pretty soon. So if you're into pinball, keep an eye out for that. Arg Super Contra or Grizor or Robo Protector in Europe. Sends two latch pulses, and that's messing up my system. If 
Why does it do that? Well, I have to assume that might happen. So, okay, if bit count equals 255, so I think I, what I could do is I could make a flag. I thought of a possible solution, although it's pretty kludgy. I mean, we do have our one millisecond main logic loop here. Uh, I don't know, capture time. Capture time equals zero. So you can say we do have a C timer, but I mean, we really don't need it because we already have a one millisecond timer that we set up. Well, no matter what, capture time, well, here, actually. If ch -ch capture time equals 10 milliseconds, uh, that's when we get the pads. So we could, we could basically fill the pad data right before the system needs it. Well, actually, I mean, I guess we could go right in the middle. Oh, and then we would also uh, reset capture time to zero. All right. Uh, it didn't work. <clears throat> oh, oops. I left this check mark here. I think it's time to learn to stop worrying and love the bomb. I just uh, greatly simplified it. I still use the capture time, so I wait eight milliseconds before I get the pads. Um, but then, yeah, I'm just letting Contra pulse it twice. It's like, screw it. So after uh, after eight bits come in, then we reset the capture time. But because otherwise, I mean, does it really matter if it outputs the data twice? Because it's when the Nintendo pulses or does a second pulse. Well, here uh, I'm turning on my camera. These are always so hard to add. I need to like have better marks of when I turn on my camera. I remember when Max and Allison was like, oh, we need to get a direct capture off of the scope. That was such a pain in the butt. Just like, just shoot, point a camera at the scope. Who cares? Make sure you get the name of the scope in for advertising purposes. All right, so here's Contra trying to read both controllers. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, it's outputting the same data twice, basically. Uh, but who cares? Because the Nintendo, and I guess that would, that would happen either way. It just depends on which register the Nintendo is reading the return bits out of. Well, actually, they, they're in the same register. They're just different bits in a byte. But shouldn't shouldn't affect us. And now it works. So, yeah, I, I just was overthinking it. Uh, well, the big thing is I moved the, 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 the part of my code where it samples the, the joysticks. I just moved that. So that happens... Happens eight milliseconds after the eighth bit, because you need to do it that way. Because otherwise, in a one-player game, you went, might not get 16 uh, bits. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so I'm sampling my my pads right around there. So, uh oh, speedrunners, yes, there's 16 milliseconds of your life you're being robbed of. Hell, before I go on, obviously have to. Beat one stage of Contra, like this. <laughs> and the problem is not just the disassociation with the jump button on your foot, uh, but the fact that it's kind of slippery. Oh! But I will use cheap cardboard. Actually, I think it'd probably be better with my shoe on. That's better. Oh, 
Now I just gotta beat this helicopter that has a beating heart. I've added some things. Change counter, change base, change target. So counter will count up to target, and when it hits it, then it will beep and change modes. So when you push the button, it's going to increment the change base by 15,000. Uh, so it'd be 15, 30, 60, 60 would be one minute, approximately. Then if you push the button again, that'd be 75,000, which means it would never reach it with a 16-bit timer. Uh, change base is a 32-bit number, by the way. So anyway, if you push the button when change of base is at 75,000, it'll go back to 15,000. So 75,000 will be used to turn it off. Uh, I found another example here, the same person from Chromia. The ADC. Now we're out of pins, but I think what we could do is uh, probably use the Ness clock line as an ADC. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the latch line. The latch line spends most of its time low. It's not pulled high by the Nintendo, and uh, the, the cable should act as a bit of an antenna, which should hopefully pick up some noise. <laughs> so we want some noise. Interrupt and digital buffer input disabled. Okay. Got it. Uh, so we would have to re-enable the interrupt before the next uh, game cycle, but that should be all right. Blah, blah, blah. Then there's all this. Got you, suckers. Where's voltage reference set at? Okay. Looks like that's working. Something tells me this video is going to get kind of long. Uh, let's see. VRF control. All right. Let's go 1.1 1, 1 volt. I think we can go even lower. Uh, yeah, that should be good enough, though. That should give us some noise. Let's use capture time to do a few more things. Switch. Capture time, and we're going to want to increment that as we did before. Okay, so we were we were getting the values at case eight, so we'll we'll do that the same as we did before since it works. But we can do a few other things as well, and by doing it this way, we can set up some timing. Uh, so, for instance, six milliseconds after the pulse we can change the state of the input pin. I mean, it's still an input pin, but we can disable the digital buffer as we talked about. Pin three control, because yeah, we're using it for an interrupt. Yeah, okay, that would also disable the interrupt, but that, that's fine because it's not, gonna, it's not gonna happen again. Okay, what bit do we use to disable the analog input or the digital input, I should say? I wish some of these references were better. I mean, they're okay. These are all the same. Oh, okay, input disable is four. Oh, I think they have a macro for that. Oh yeah, port IS, blah, 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 input disable. Okay, so we'll just set it to that. Okay, so disable digital input which will also disable the interrupt. Then after we get the pads, we can start an ADC conversion. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, how do we start the ADC conversion? Oh, here we go, start conversion. Right in a one to this, we'll start a single conversion. Okay. Yes, I'll mow the front lawn. Jiminy Christmas. Yeah, conversion won't take very long, especially when we're doing things in, you know. Yeah, 12 is getting kind of close to the next loop. Let's do 10. All right, so now that we got it, where's the result? I think, oh, yeah, it's, uh, we have to use two bytes for the result since we want. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go, result. ADC result low, result high, so we just want result low. Okay, so an ADC zero. Yeah, I, th I think this thing actually has two separate ADCs on it. And by that, I mean, it could actually do two conversions at the same time. That's pretty impressive for a tiny little chip. 
What was that randomizer thing that we had? Ran Rander Seed? <laughs> Rander Seed. <laughs> My name's Rander Seed. Oh, I'll run these outlands. <laughs> All right, do that. And then after we do that, we will revert pin three back to interrupt mode. Just in time for the interrupts. Let's make sure we didn't break anything. And then we can add the randomizer to the joystick order and of course the timer does the alarm it will uh change the target back to the base or the next base so you know five seconds ten seconds whatever then it will store rander seed and uh seven which is the lower three bits into temp then switch state will be temp minus two so we get zero to five then if switch state equals last state we'll increment switch state by one which could also make it um six so in which case we'll just make switch state zero and then last state would have been five so we'll leave last state oh wait no that would also need to be the same as switch state okay yeah duh never mind uh else last state equals switch state so we'll change the state and then we'll store the state and then when we change the state we'll make sure we don't change what we were before and then finally uh we'll the target will increase temp by 375 uh, milliseconds, so we'd be looking at a maximum of 7 times 375, uh, 2.6 seconds of deviation. And that might not be enough to throw people off. Five, oh, 555, five, five, like the timer. <laughs> nice. Okay, I think I have it working pretty well now. So I've got the button here. This changes the timing. So that sound right there, that means it's no longer in active mode and all the controllers should work. That's uh, 10 seconds, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and then off. Uh, I've, just, I've adjusted the code. It normally goes in a loop or in a, in a chain. However, it makes sure that nobody has the same controls. Nobody has the same controls twice Although, um, about one, one fourth or one fifth of the time, it will randomly select which state to go to. So it uses the, it uses the ADC to create a random number. And in that case, it randomly picks a state. So it kind of seeds the randomness a little bit more. Because otherwise people will hack the system. Well, I think this should be pretty good. So yeah, there you go. That's my that's my MGC Game Night uh, social NES controller. It's basically you have three people controlling one character, and the system randomly changes who is controlling what for hopefully great fun. I think I'm probably gonna do like a tournament, like you know, groups of three people who can get the farthest in a video game, like. We know le what level of Contra can you get to, you know, can you beat the game? It should be interesting and fun. So, yeah, hopefully we'll see you there at the Midwest Gaming Classic Game Nights at the Sheridan, July 2nd and 3rd.